much broader reach. And the, the primary intent of it really was um, about supporting the formation and growth of, of networks and connections between learners, graduates, faculty, peers, between disciplines, um, with research, with community, with industry. So it's taking a very broad level approach to um, making connections. Um, <coughs> And that was really fed by a number of things. So we knew that the demographic of students coming into Greenwich, quite often they are the first representative of their family group. They don't bring them with themselves um, a great understanding or a great kind of comfort with the processes and practices of higher education. And so it's hard for them necessarily to feel instantly part of that academic community, to see themselves as belonging, and to suffer some of, and to cope with some of the kind of the buffets and the, the you know, dips and shallows and so on of, of those first experiences at university and, and to orientate themselves within them. So it was really about helping them feel kind of connected both within the institution but also then developing those skills of network forming, dissolving, using, repurposing that they could then take out with them into their future careers. And the project took a number of, number of phases which are kind of summed up by the timeline there. Um, and initially, around April 2012, we had a relatively new Vice-Chancellor who expressed um, both uh, an interest and a kind of desire to push big ideas around how we could change teaching and learning, how we could define teaching and learning within the institution. So um, that led to a kind of research phase that took two parts. So originally there was a kind of literature review, uh, looking at the debates, particularly around pedagogy, to answer a kind, of, uh, a kind of broad question, what does it mean to be a modern university in the digital age? From then, the second part of that research, uh, then um, a number of us went out and conducted focus groups, surveys and interviews with representatives from across the university, so all parts of the university community. And that was really to make sure that we fully understood the University of Greenwich context, its readiness for such a kind of uh, such a vision, and to define, kind of having understood the broader picture of what it meant to the sector to be that kind of institution, to define in what way the University of Greenwich could live out that, that kind of vision. So in May 2013, um, we had a small amount of funding, so this was kind of the first, first phase, um, and that included the seed fund projects that what we're reporting on today is going to focus on. I mean, it was a limited amount of funding at this stage. That was partly through the kind of the, the period we were in in the funding cycle of the university or funding the year. But I think there was also um, an element of um, a kind of proof of practicability. So there was a kind of testing ground. So there's a small, a small part of money. See what you can do. See what kind of results, and that will lead on to something else, which indeed it did. So later in the year, we're in the new academic year. New budgets became available. Um, and then we had a, an increased funding, an increased time scale and scope of what we were going to deliver. And uh, we're now entering from kind of about now, um, partly due to personnel stage, uh, changes. So Peter is obviously about to go to the LSC and Peter's replacement is just about to, to start, us, start with us. So we now have a full team in place to deliver this and kind of the, the in-depth embedding of the vision begins from now. Okay, and I'm going to pass over to my colleague Monica, who will talk some more about the Seafront project. So, the Seafront projects are key to this presentation. The results will be brought to draw the largely on what we can have from here. Um, about June last year, we announced a couple of projects which utilise technology. So it gave opportunity to staff to bid for predetermined kits of equipment and those kit kits of equipment included um, cameras, iPads, um, podcasting equipment. So that pedagogical purpose in mind that we had was to encourage student creative content, uh, to encourage digital storytelling, connectivity and sharing. And we tried to engage with openness agenda through the use of social media. So social media was, was some sort of vehicle for openness for us for this particular project. And as Peter mentioned, apart, uh, apart from encouraging content creation, um, content, created, content creation by the students, we also try to create safe space for academics to experiment with pedagogical practice, to 
try new things without the anxiety, without the fear of, of doing something wrong and things not working out. The assumption that we had was that students and staff already engage with technology in their private lives. So students are quite proficient with the use of social media and what they do outside of academia. So they did not need te technological or technical training as such. What we needed to focus them for this project was to try to repurpose those skills that they acquired in the private life to fit the learning environment and to, to utilize them for academic purposes. So um, on this slide you have um, some of the statistics. So this is what we, this is how much money we got and this is how we uh, distributed the equipment. And So basically what we did, once these things went out, we started to sort of look at what kind of resistance we got from staff and students to actually engaging in open practices. And I think this notion of institutional resistance is, is quite critical. So we'll talk about institutional resistance to technology. Now clearly institutions, as I mentioned at the top, are actually quite slow in being able to adapt to changes in technology. MOOCs is probably the exception to that rule which has kind of proved the rule in the past that they haven't necessarily been particularly quick. So when it came to trying to overcome institutional resistance technology, which we think is primarily connected with resources, in most instances it's connected with resources, they see it as a resource intensive process, they see that it's going to change practice, and those things are expensive. Um, we tried a number of uh, processes which we sort of put in place, not simply because we'd experienced institutional resistance, because we knew it was there from our initial research. So we did a fairly extensive consultation and horizon scanning process, which was well communicated to everyone in the institution. It was distributed all to all staff, we did briefings, we tried to uh, at least put in context for the institution that this was based in, in some sort of tradition. Uh, we did a development of an aspirational vision. We didn't write a strategy, we didn't write another set of policy documents. We basically came up with what was a vision for the, for the school, for the institution. What it would look like if we actually engaged in a much more open and connected way of teaching and learning. We resourced these projects through the C fund and instead of expecting students to use their own equipment in a BYOD sense, we actually gave staff and students the equipment to use. We gave them resources, we tried to make it as easy as possible for people to do these things. And we gave training, support and positive reinforcement to all of this. What was interesting about this is we had an incredibly low take up. Uh, around uh, applications from only 3% of the academic staff. What was quite fascinating is that around 75% of the applications were from people who had just completed their PG cert. So these were the interested but young teachers. There was a significant policy and authority creep, which was actually not you know, unsurprising the moment you start saying, well, we actually want students to distribute content that made themselves through YouTube. Oh, well, the institutions have got a problem with that. We've got to make sure that we, 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 we've censored it, we've looked at it. We don't, yeah, so that, there was significant policy creep from other parts of the institution. There was a dramatic siloing of responsibility. Because all three of us were working for an educational development unit, which is inside the centre of a quite disaggregated institution, the immediate response we got from a lot of people was, oh, it's another EDU project. And it sort of turned into the resistance that we'd hoped to avoid, which was we don't want a whole lot of little projects, we actually wanted institutional wide change. And finally, we actually experienced some significant resistance from senior management. Even though the Vice Chancellor was incredibly supportive of this, we had consistent responses from deans, from Deputy Vice Chancellors, from Pro Vice Chancellors, that all said, Well, what are you going to do to us now? Yeah, we're brilliant, we're doing really good, what are you doing? What are you going to do to us now? But on a positive sense, we actually had some inspiring examples where people actually made fundamental curricular change because of seeing that they, there was an environment to do this in. The next level that we had, which I'll hand over to my colleague, was individual resistance to technology. Okay, so we're kind of coming down from the structures and the, the systems in place within the university and coming down to the level of the, the people actually participating in these projects. And I'm going to talk about some of the steps we took and then again some of the resistances or things that we characterise as resistance that we encountered. 
I mean, I guess in some ways the, uh, the points about such a low application for it, in a way, is a kind of individual resistance to it as well. But um, the steps we took, we were, we were concerned that the, the equipment that we provided, we wanted to make it so, uh, we took a decision that it would be a kind of mid-scale equipment. So we were conscious of not, what we wanted to do was take things beyond the kind of the personal, uh, kind of domestic appliances to add to that, that sort of um, the novelty value, um, the, the kind of the intrigue of something that was a bit of a step up, but also because we thought that that would communicate something around that this is now applying something for kind of a more professional purpose, that it's, it's moving out of that kind of uh, that personal social sphere and into professional practice. But at the same time, we wanted to balance that with not giving people kind of very high end, um, you know, proper pro video cameras that were actually acquired in a, you know, an awful lot of technical getting, getting familiar with that they produce. So we didn't want to put, put people off with that. We encouraged the programs to use social media for sharing, largely because we, we had this assumption backed up by the research that we, that we drew on that um, the students and staff will be familiar with the underlying processes of sharing, commenting, um, that, that were within those social media platforms, so that it would be a much, a much smaller step to get onto the kind of the critiquing and so on that, that we wanted to see happening. Again, we provided training and resources, and that was both to support kind of the technical use of the equipment, but also kind of aesthetic considerations. So, um, you know, a simple guide to how you create a good video, how you create a, what is a, a good framing, and that kind of thing. And overall, you know, we thought we wanted to create this as a sort of spe safe space for experimentation. So there's an explicit encouragement for the, the uh, individual projects to take a playful approach and an explicit acceptance that this could, might lead to failures in inverted commas and that that was okay, that was part of the, the uh, public project expectations. The kind of resistance that we got was that even when people had bid for through the bid process and received equipment, quite often they were slow to get started. So although they'd, they'd gone through the process of kind of outlining how it would fit into their curriculum processes, somehow the actual practice of bringing that about, there was a kind of slowness to get that ball rolling. We found in some cases students just had a preference for their own equipment. So even though um, the projects they were doing were couched in terms of something uh, a bit more serious, I suppose, or academic or professional, they were still clinging to the devices that they felt really comfortable with, which was, which was quite interesting to us. Um, we encountered a kind of expectation among staff particularly, but I think it was also evidence from some students that they would need more training. So there's a kind of a demand for more formal kind of one-to-one -one workshop style training, um, which we weren't really resourced to provide. But it was interesting that that seemed to be a mindset that seemed to go against the idea of getting something on plane with it and learning about it through, through play. Um, and there was a very mixed response to experimentation. So maybe there were other inhibiting factors at play. You know, we'd said, we want you to experiment. We accept if you fail. Maybe there were other inhibiting factors that were at play, that were at play there. But again, um, there was a significant amount of very exciting kind of experimentation and development. But interestingly, again, it seemed to happen very much amongst mainly kind of new and emerging academics. So that was as if embedded within the bid itself. 
um, and that was done to ensure connectivity across the project as well, so that we can we can um, promote good practice across the university. Now, the challenges that we had at the uh, policy level was interference with institutional policy. So even though we were working our own, our own OER and social media policy, there was some um, some pockets in the university that were working on their own policy, which interfered with ours. So we quite often had uh, problems with the marketing department who um, asked academics to shut down the YouTube account and, and work with the institutional one. Um, so lack of unity was one of the challenges. The second one was lack of understanding of the purpose of social media and education, um, which also leads to, to, um, to the policy. Um, the openness and showing of student creative content was, um, was quite often hampered by lack of trust in students. So academics felt quite often insecure and comfortable with giving complete control to the, to the learners and tried to edit the work before publishing or publish on a more closed platform um, to, to control the damage, in a way, uh, which is opposite of openness really. Um, and, and so the challenge that we had was not content creation, so students were happy to create, but the content curation that came from that lack of trust. And finally, there were some reservations to share um, lecturers' work. So they were, some of them were not happy to, to share what the project they were doing across the university. And that was quite often the case with the project that were more innovative. So if there was some sort of new app involved, they would be quite reserved about sharing development. So just to wrap this up, I think uh, what we try to do, and the paper explores this far better, is kind of put this in a true, in a true academic sense, put it in a model, um, which we've called the rivers of resistance, and it, and it tries to push these time, what happens if you don't respond or don't have ways to manage strategic implementation where, where institutional resistance actually is there. Now we know, critically, institutional resistance is probably in every single institution in the world. It's, it's, a, it's a nature of not just of institutions, but it's the nature of organisations and the way organisations react and respond to change. So I, we think that the notion of trying to overcome resistance through fun and experimentation was a bit of a 50-50 hit and miss. There were some really good um, examples where people felt liberated and democratised to actually go and do that. There were some really bad examples where people felt that it was you know, a change too far or if we to coin the phrase, a bridge too far over the rivers of resistance. Uh, but for us, it, was, it is fundamental to the notion of education that in the modern era, where employability is king and graduate destinations are one of the five things that determine the future and destiny of every vice-chancellor on the planet, that there is still an opportunity for staff to, to trial, play, and do, share with other people, not just share with their own colleagues, but share with people inside the institution, outside the institution, and that we don't have a culture of fear of failure. Because these are experimental things. We're in a situation where we're trying to transform curricula from having technology as a wraparound to curricula, and actually making it a fundamental part of curricula. So if we're hoping to transform that, we're going to be making some errors and mistakes on the way. So hopefully we were able to at least build some of that in um, because the team is now reconstructed and there's now a new team of people that will progress that forward. Um, and once again, we have exceptional support from the Vice-Chancellor, which I think is critical in any of these kind of uh, strategic developments that you have the support from online. So that's our presentation. Is there any questions? Please ask him. has been the emphasis on open educational practices and this presentation certainly gave us an insight into some of the, the barriers to that and some of the ways in which that they might be overcome. So I think it's particularly pertinent to where we are in open education and the OER movement today. So, are there any questions? Um, hi, yeah. my name is Todd Sam from Sussex, excuse me. Um, I just wanted to ask maybe whether you had um, like the resistance it, you put it in, in a kind of institutional framework, but other other people sometimes look at things in terms of motivation or other ways. But were there any incentives um, in the way that you put things together for people to change? What kind of incentives might there be 
other than just maybe a motivation and so on? Well, I think there's probably three. I think having the kids there, where they didn't have to think through the process of what 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 the who was going to be, so that in some ways was a, was a grant. Is three and a half, four thousand pounds worth of equipment. So that was one incentive. We'd hoped that the sharing of practice, that when they actually did good stuff and we told the rest of the world about it, that that would also be an incentive because basically in an institution like Greenwich, and it's actually kind of similar in the LSE as well, there isn't a lot of sharing of good teaching and learning practice. There's a hell of a lot of sharing of good research achievements, but not as much sharing of good teaching and learning practice. Um, and the third thing is that we actually had a series of conferences inside the, inside the institution that were aimed at actually sort of showcasing people. Um, and we hoped that those conferences would equal it with like providing people with an opportunity to talk at those conferences, share their, their practice with other people would also be an incentive. In the longer term, once, once more funding comes, then we hoped that instead of having to buy equipment, we would be able to give money to buy time which is one of those really critical factors that most people need to be able to buy themselves out of a day of teaching or half a day of teaching to be able to do these things. Because as Tony mentioned, in the funding cycle we were in, we had uh, about six weeks to spend the money. So we went with the buying of the equipment rather than the, the incentive to buy time. But I think buying time is a very good incentive. Thanks. Any other questions? One pass to the back. Hi, can you um, let us know where the funding came from? Was it within the institution or was it an external bid? Take the to ask the questions. Yeah, it was purely all internal funding. So it's completely managed funded within the University of Greenwich and its budgets. And so in terms of the equipment that you purchase now, mm -hmm. how do you kind of ensure that that doesn't, and this is just from my own experience within my own institution, um, kind of gets dusty in a cupboard somewhere. Um, yeah. and, and how do you ensure that it, it kind of yeah. comes out for, for, for more projects? Well, we're just going to do the, the second cycle of these projects. So the projects had a specific time scale to do stuff. Um, and that, the, the, that equipment is coming back and a new open call for more projects is going to go out. So we've got a rolling cycle of it. Within that, we've got some other incentives. So there's, um, we're planning on rewarding like, the particularly kind of standout projects that they don't have to reapply for the equipment, but they can keep it and then extend what they're doing further. Um, people who already have the equipment can, of course, reapply and explain how they're going to develop what they've found out in that year. Um, one of the things that we're hoping is that those kind of changes, and this is something that we're kind of pursuing through the kind of evaluative phase, because we're just coming through to the end of the academic year that people have been working on these projects. So we're pursuing with the kind of um, the faculty level management, the departmental level management, what people have been doing, and whether the faculties themselves then recognise the change that's happened, both want to then take that on and see whether that can spread across within the faculty or within the department, and also about funding, you know, because although it's a significant amount of money within faculty budgets, you know, a couple of thousand is probably not really a, a big deal. So in theory, if faculties value what's happened, then they should be able to fund it themselves. So that's how we're hoping that, that it will kind of gather momentum and spread out. And yeah, and not significantly going to Thanks, Any other questions? Sam Thomas, I'm from the Open University. Um, I just wondered, you've mentioned evaluation, I just wondered if you'd have any student feedback about the impact of some of the um, changes that have been made as a result of the project. And if you had, if, if that's been um, distributed more widely amongst the academics at the institution. So um, it, it varies really from, from project to project, but in general, students really appreciate 